Hello, I'm Silent Death, and welcome to the second episode of the Comprehensive Affairm Aerospace Research Tutorial. In this episode, we will be covering landing gear placement, engines, their velocity curves, and intakes. Let's discuss a landing gear placement. This craft uses the most common arrangement, a tricycle arrangement, where you have two landing gear near the center of mass and then another landing gear forward. The landing gear forward should have the brakes off and should have a steering enabled. While well, these have a steering disabled and the brakes enabled. That way, when you're trying to stop, you don't flip forward. And when you're trying to steer, you really only need the front rear, the front wheel to control that. A few important things to note. You must make sure that your landing gear are straight and uh, symmetrical. For instance, if we replace this front landing gear with a, I think it's called a, a small landing gear from the adjustable landing gear mod. And we're using angle snap to make sure that it's right in the center. However, you will notice that the wheel is not actually in the center of the part. So the wheel's actually slightly off center. Let's see what happens when we try to launch that. All right, we'll start accelerating. And initially everything looks fine. But if we try to turn at all, something that will happen if, for instance, you're using the level 1 or level 2 runways, and you hit a potholer, for instance, then it wants to kind of tilt over and just hang right there because the wheel is not in the center. So it is very, very important to make sure that front wheel is dead center. The same sort of problem can be caused by wheels such as these rear wheels that are splayed out. If wheels are touching the ground at an angle, the game does not really like that very much. So you want to make sure that all your wheels touch the ground vertically and then use the offset tools. Put them where you want them. Like so. In this configuration, the main landing gear are just behind the center of mass. And the landing gear are the pivot point for the plane when it is taking off or landing. With the landing gear slightly behind the center of mass, the center of mass will push the nose down during a takeoff and landing, so it does require a bit more pitch control to get off the airstrip. However, for this particular plane, we have that in the form of canards and the tail section. There are other wheel arrangements, such as a tail dragger plane. Where you have a single small landing gear at the back. And then these landing gear would be for the forward. You almost never see this particular design in a Kerbal Space Program. It is generally used in the real world 
for a prop driven craft to keep their propellers clear of the ground. That's not really an issue for us. Another design you could have is simple quad. Where you have two landing gear in the front and two in the back. Which provides a little bit more stability, but is not as common. There is also the consideration of the distance from the ground you want to place the landing gear to give your plane a little bit of tilt on the ground. You can have your plane level, which doesn't have any particular advantages or disadvantages. Placing the landing gear so that the nose is tipped up makes it easier to take off. This is a configuration that you see rather frequently in stock, mostly because it is the configuration that tends to be formed by placing splayed landing gear at the rear. So we did not even have to touch the controls for us to take off. Just raise the landing gear. However, this is generally a pretty bad idea to use in Ferrum Aerospace. Taking off is not the hard part, landing is. And with your landing gear set to point your nose upward, you tend to have a pretty bouncy landing. Like this. Also, notice that as we bounce up, our steering landing gear, the one in the front, spends the most time off the ground. So if we started going in the wrong direction, we would not have any ability to change our direction. Not a recommended method. Having the landing gear tilted down makes the entire plane act as a spooler. And will hold you firmly to the ground requiring more control surfaces, more pitch authority, for you to get off the ground, but it does not make a landing much, much easier. Like so. Another thing you may want to consider when placing your landing gear is protecting your tail section. If you have a very long plane, when you pull up, you may risk this striking the runway. Also, when you're landing, that can be an issue, especially if you're landing on rough terrain. So simply putting an additional landing gear back there that will not be touching the ground when you're taking off, but if you pull up too hard, it will protect this area. Or if you try to land at too steep an angle, it will also protect your tail section. There are three air breathing engines in the stock game. The basic jet engine, the turbo jet engine, and the rapier engine. All three of these engines require some form of air intake to function. Unlike rocket engines, the thrust for air breathing engines can change with velocity. This is known as the velocity curve. Ferrum Aerospace overwrites the stock velocity curve with its own. Other mods can overwrite Ferrum Aerospace's velocity curve with their own. Many which velocity curve your engines will use depends on which mods you have installed. I will discuss the velocity curve for Ferrum Aerospace Research and for B9 Aerospace. 
as I find information about them difficult to locate in the documentation if you do not know how to read the config files. For the basic jet engine, using Ferrum Aerospace Research, it starts out at 100% thrust, standing still, then decreases to 20% at 250 meters per second, and then slowly drops down to 0% thrust at 350 meters per second. Using B9 Aerospace, it again has max thrust standing still, slowly decreasing to two-thirds at 500 meters per second, and then rapidly decreasing to 0% at 650 or 605 meters per second. For the turbojet engine, using Ferrum Aerospace, Standing still, it has 80% thrust. Then peaks to 100% thrust at 900 meters per second. Then slowly goes to 0% thrust at 1800 meters per second. Using B9 Aerospace, Standing still, it only has 56% thrust. It peaks out at 100% thrust at 950 meters per second and rapidly drops to 0% thrust at 1,090 meters per second. Using Ferrum Aerospace, the Rapier engine starts out at 80% thrust Standing still, it peaks out at 100% thrust at 1100 meters per second, then slowly drops to 0% thrust at 1700 meters per second. B9 Aerospace does not change these values. Note that the rapier engine in air breathing mode will flame out under 33% while the basic jet and turbojet will flame out under 10%. That means if you're providing less than one tenth of the amount of air the turbojet or basic jet needs, they will flame out. Which is generally a very bad thing while the rapier will flame out if you're providing less than one third. Or, if you're in automatic switching mode, it will switch to rocket mode. Also note that some engines will automatically throttle down if they are running low on air. This can lead to issues where you have asymmetric thrust with one engine throttling down, but the other one still going at full speed causing your plane to skew without you really realizing what is happening. So it is important to watch your air intake numbers and control your throttle so that you do not exceed the requirements. Now let's move on to air intakes. There are a number of stock air intakes the circular intake, the ram air intake, the two engine and the cells intakes that also contain fuel, the shock cone intake, and two radial intakes. This radial intake and this structural radial intake. In terms of weight per area, the ram intake is the best and the structural intake is the worst. 
In terms of absolute intake area, the shot cone intake has the largest intake area. There are three things that affect uh, the amount of air you get from an intake. One is the intake area. Two is the air speed. And three is your angle of attack. Thus, as you go faster, you'll get more air coming into your intake. The larger intakes produce more air. And the closer you're pointing towards your prograde vector will give you more air. The general rule of thumb is that you need about 0.03 intake area per engine for high flying craft. So the radial air intake has 0.06. These have a 0.012. These have the worst at 0.0025, requiring you to have 12 of them per engine. The ram and air intakes, you only need three of those. You need six of these radial engine bodies, or engine nacelles. A little bit over three of these circular intakes, which is why they're rarely used. That is it for this episode. In the next episode, we will be moving on to some more advanced concepts, control surfaces, and a swept wing design. If you have any questions about what was covered in this episode, please ask in the comments below, and I will do my best to answer your questions. Like if you like, subscribe if you're not, Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.